uh, I need the screen share to be allowed to me. Seems that host disabled that. So can someone uh, able me to share the screen? Okay. Can you see my full screen? Yeah, we can yes, see. Yes, yes, we can. Yes. So I love water and I do love water because water, you can see that in liquid and gas and solid in the planet. And that's, it's already a weirdness of water. But before I start to talk, I want to present my research group, also near water in, in the south of Brazil before this pandemic. So the reason why water is it's very important is because it's abundant. However, even though abundant, even though it covers 70% of the surface of the planet, water is not present in enough quantities everywhere. And that's a picture of the stress of water in 1950, in which the more red, more is stressed. Already in 1950, part of Africa, Europe, and Asia had less water than they need to live. That's the concept of stress water. If you advance in time, you observe that more and more the countries become red in the sense of having less water than they need to live. And that is the perspective for a few years from, from today. So it means that half of the population of the world will be living in regions in which they don't have enough water to be dry. So what's the idea? Water have more than 70 anomalies. Anomalies means the behavior in which water is different from the other materials. Uh, water is so common, so everyday in our lives that we think that is normal liquid, but it's completely and crazily abnormal. And my challenge is always, how can I understand these anomalies and use them to produce more clean water? That's the purpose of my research group. Let me point it out a few anomalies that are in our everyday life that already we understood quite well. One of these anomalies is that when you look to the specific heat of water, the specific heat as any material and really straight in methanol in the picture below, increase when increase the temperature. However, water have a minimum and then it starts to increase at very low temperatures. The second issue is about the specific heat of water is that very large, what means that I have to get, give a lot of heat to the water to increase a little bit the temperature. And we understand the reason for that is related to the fact that water molecules make with each other hydrogen bonds. Another anomaly that again is in our everyday life is the fact that most liquid, when you heat them, they, they contract like we do in a, in, in a cold day, but water have an increase Increase of density means it gets in contracting, reach a maximum at, uh, um, at four centigrades in one atmosphere and then expands. So have a completely unusual behavior that because we see every day, we don't think that's that unusual behavior. Is that instead of being contracting, 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 is to contract and then it expands. Another behavior that unusual. Nature already took, use it, some of those anomalies. For instance, it uses it when the maximum of density, because if the maximum is at one atmosphere at four centigrade, means that when you cold a river or a lake, you're going to find that the maximum density, the density at the bottom will be at four centigrade. What makes possible to have ice in the top, zero centigrade water, and then you get colder and colder and life survives at very cold weather. What was very important for the creation of evolution. So already, nature already uses some of those anomalies. By the way, the specific heat anomaly means that having this huge specific heat that you have to give a lot of heat to increase a little bit the temperature is already used in our bodies and, and to balance uh, the temperature of the sea in the planet because you have to give a lot of heat or take a lot of heat to increase or decrease a little bit of temperature. So water be become a material to obtain a thermal value. 
And all the reasons for these anomalies is the crazy games that water make hydrogen bond. Mother, water is this, have this V shape, which allows to have a polarization. The oxygens get all the electrons and the poor hydrogens become electronless. And this, this generate a polarization. This polarization allows water to free, make bonds, hydrogen bonds with four other molecules around the water. What makes water when you decrease temperature to form this huge network. And also this explain why when you decrease the temperature, they want to make all the hydrogen bonds. So the distance increase so it's possible to balance all the hydrogen bonds. So we already understand the mechanism behind most of the anomalies of water. And it's related to this balance between not making a bond and making a bond when you decrease the temperature. To make a bond, you have to put a little bit apart the molecule. Some years ago, our research group decided to explore what happens with water when you nano-confine. You put water in a very, very, very narrow space, a nanotube. And we did that by simulations. So we construct two reservoirs of water and you flow water to these nanotubes. And the nanotubes we thought was carbon nanotubes that are hydrophobic. And you see how water flows to these nanotubes and what happens with this flow. Also, we observe how water moves, diffuse inside these nanotubes. We construct a model for water in which we balance this making hydrogen bonds, not making hydrogen bonds. That's a technical issue. It's not relevant for the discussion I want to make here. So what we found is that when you make the tube the diameter of the tube, smaller, smaller, smaller. The diffusion coefficient that measures the ability of moving the molecules start to decrease as you would expect it. If you have less space, things move less. However, we observe that at a certain point, particles just stop moving, moving. they freeze inside the tube, freeze at a temperature in which water is not freezing. So the first weirdness, first it decreases. that's not weird, it's like us in a very packed bus, we move less, but suddenly everything freezes. And for diameters a little bit smaller than the freezing, water starts to move again. And as it makes smaller and smaller, it's moving faster, it's moving faster and faster. That's G fusion. And how we understand that? You understand that because it freezes when you just have enough space for two lines of tetrameters, that's a bunch of water molecules, to be bounded. When you decrease a little bit, if there is no space then to be bounded. So they form this picture down here that's a single line. And the single line is free to move, is free to diffuse. So that's already a weirdness of water because of this hydrogen bonds. Other molecules, you're not going to freeze. You're going to just have less and less and less and less mobility until you don't have space enough for the other mole molecules. To, to do that. We test with other types of materials and they don't have this zero and increase observed in the diffusion of water. A second thing we challenge ourselves to understand is an experiment that performed not with all water diffusing, but water flow. And what people observe is that water in nano confinement violate the hydrodynamic equations as you decrease the diameter of the confinement, water start to increase the enhancement factor. What's the enhancement factor is the ratio between the velocity that the water having this nano confinement and the velocity it should have if water would flow in nano confinement in the same way that flows in the sink of our houses. So as you decrease the spice, you observe this up 
then you observe a down, and then you observe a super up. For nanoconfinement of diameter below one nanometer, water can flow a thousand times faster than it flows if it would obey the hydrodynamic equations. So that was a surprise. I want to understand how it happens, why it happens. So again, we took our reservoirs, but now instead of only looking water diffusing, we observe the flowing of water. And we observe in our behavior the same enhancement up, king, and up. We have many lines because we, we test different potentials, but also because we do simulations, you could look what was happening. Each sphere is not a water molecule, but a tetramer is a bunch of four water molecules. And you can see that as you put the, the water confined, they form layers like an onion, and they organize in these layers. And the kink that goes down is exactly when you pass from two layers to one single layer. And this one single layer of the tremors is the one that can flow very, very fast. That's why actually strongly violate hydrodynamic equations because the stress with the wall are not the natural models we have the stress with the wall. I hope you can see, unfortunately, the movie is not running, but this should be a movie showing, ah, now it's working, showing this, remember, this each sphere is for water molecules. They are lining. And why they are lining? Because they cannot fit side by side, keeping an hydrogen bond. So they prefer to line with a distance that will be an hydrogen bond. And they are repelling to the wall. This super, super fast flow make us think that maybe we can construct filters for water desalination using this property that water flows very fast in nano confinement. And we know that salt don't like to enter in small spaces because in order to enter in the small spaces, the salt we have to give up the layer of water molecules around the salt particles. Another aspect we also e examine is what happens if now I take my nanotube and I paint the nanotube part with a material that will love water, hydrophilic, and a part with hates water, hydrophobic. And instead of putting water in our reservoir, we are going to put water vapor in that I'm illustrating here in pink. So what happens is that close to the hydrophilic border, this red uh, orange border, the pink becomes liquid and I'm illustrating the liquid with the red. And with that, we can use the fast flow of nanotubes, not only to make water flow, but also to capture water from water vapor and have a way to make it flow quite fast. We did tests with different ways of painting, making poorly hydrophobic, half hydrophilic, half hydrophobic, poorly hydrophilic to find the right balance with the right diameter. And here I'm illustrating that if I make the diameter too huge, I have a, a, a flux that's not very good, it's very almost zero. However, if I paint half and half, that's this case, I can have a good balance of fast flow and also transforming water vapor in liquid water. Finally, we also examine what happens if now I put salt. In this movie, I'm illustrating salt and the water is transparent. So I have water molecules and I have salt and I have a layer of a membrane of uh, molybdenum disulfate with a pore on it. And you press that and you can see that the water passes because you see this uh, 
this floating thing, wiggling thing, uh, gray in the other side, that's the water, but the salt rarely passed. Again, the nano, the, the pores have to be below one nanometer of uh, diameter. And with that, the water is able to pass, but the salt, because you have to, to remove the hydration shell, it doesn't pass through the systems. The proposition is that we can think about constructing desalination membranes using this type of nanopores. Another issue of constructing these desalination membranes, here I just did one pore, is what happens if now I start to put too many pores. One afraid I would have is that we generate like in normal hydrodynamic behavior, turbulence and one pore will compromise the entrance of water of the other part. So we construct di different membranes with two pores, with two distance, different distance of the pores. And what to observe that's very different from observe when you have macroscopic pores is that the flow the membrane permeability, the ability of permeate is going to just scale with the numbers of pores. If I divide by the number of pores, I'm going to have exactly the same flow rate for each pore. So one pore, even if they are very close together, they will not compromise the flow rate of each other. What means that by constructing a membrane of nanopores, not only I'm able to separate salt from water, but also I can avoid turbulence effects. Here also to show that doesn't matter the number of pores when they're divided by pore, the rejection of salt is very huge. And Notice that I'm using, because I'm doing simulation, unbelievable high pressures, much higher than usually people employ in that desalination process, just because I'm checking how good is the salt re rejection of the side of membrane. To summarize, water have weird, crazy behavior, more than 70. We can use that to understand and to improve separating water from salt. Some of the things that attract me is that water diffuses and flows faster, violating the hydrodynamic equations. And that if now I add many pores, I just sum the effect of a single pore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Marcia, for the presentation. Uh, so I think according to the schedule, uh, next one uh, will be a presentation by Prof. Ramesh from University of Malaya. Uh, the floor is yours, Prof. Please go ahead. Uh, sorry, if, if, if anyone have any question before that for uh, Prof. Marcia. Any question about the presentation that conducted by Prof. Marcia? So a question at the end, okay. Okay, so Prof Ramesh, if you could please start your presentation. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, uh, good day. I'm uh, <clears throat> Ramesh T. Subramaniam from uh, University of Malaya, Malaysia. 
and now it's uh, almost like uh, going to be like uh, 10 p.m. in Malaysia. So uh, the topic that I'm going to discuss with you all today is uh, ameliorating the redox couple base dyes and sty solar cells using two different types of iodide salts and ultrasonication copoxide nonophila. So you can look at here the main application that I'm going to present here is a dye sty solar cell where we are using different iodides and also the nanofillers. Okay, this will be the rough outline of the presentation. Okay, let me start with uh, some introduction. The current population in Malaysia is nearly like a 32.7 million. And then we can observe that the annual population growth rate is about a 0 0.1%. The country grows, the consumption increases too. Currently, most of the sources come from non renewable energy resources such as fossil fuels. So, from the diagram, you can see, uh, sorry, from the diagram, uh, you can see that the renewable energy is only about 11%. And topics that I'm going to discuss here about the solar cell will come under this 11% which is about uh, six months only. Okay, when you talk about renewable energy sources, there are four main uh, there, solar, hydro, wind, and biomass, and we are focusing on the solar cell. And then why we are using the solar cell? So solar cell is a device that can convert light energy to electrical energy. And we also know the energy of sunlight strikes the earth in one hour, more than amount of energy consumed by human for one year. So that is another beauty of the solar energy. Malaysia, uh, most of you, I'm sure you know about Malaysia. Malaysia is the tropical climate and abundant sunlight sources should be reflected as a treasure in developing this technology. Okay, let me give a, just a brief summary on the development of solar cell. Solar cell, the first generation, as we know, is actually a wafer-based silicon, which cover the monocrystalline and also the polycrystalline silicon cells. And these solar cells are highly efficient and also like a high fabrication cost. So to overcome the drawback from the first generation water wafer-based silicon, we come up with the second generation thin film solar cells. So this covers like a cadmium, telluride, copper indium, gallium selenium, and copper indium, selenium, and so on. So these second generation thin films are lower material cost, but at the same time, the main problem is a lower efficiency. That's where came the third generation, which is a new emerging technology, where I've listed a few important things like a nanocrystal based solar cell, polymer based solar cell, colloidal, quantum dot, organic solar cell, and dye-sensitized solar cells. So we are working on the dye-sensitized solar cells by using like a thin film and also like low material cost. Okay, here, these are the main three requirements for a solar cell. First, the cost need to be minimized. Second, the performance must be maximized. So normally the performance is determined by the uh, percentage of the efficiency of the solar cell. And then, we also need to focus on the durability and stability, that the life cycle need to be like at least 10 to 30 years or must be demonstrated. Okay, here you can see the, what they call like, uh, how the solar cell is fabricated. So for the solar cell, we need to have like a FTO glass, then titanium dioxide with a dye electrode. So the dye is the one which will determine so what kind of uh, inorganic salt that we're going to use for the electrolyte. And then we have electrolyte, platinum layer, and also the FTO glass. So why we are focusing on the DSSC? So here are some of the beauty of the DSSC, where DSSC is a low in cost and easy to handle. So quite easy fabrication, but of course the challenge will be to get a high efficiency. And it also could operate under dim light. So this shows it's even 
we can show that the solar cell, uh, which is Dyson size solar cell, can even work when it's uh, not uh, like a sunny day or a rainy day also. So they work at the internal low temperature and also can work at wider angles and also as the properties of the mechanical robustness. Okay, the other materials that is very important in the Dyson size solar cell is the electrolytes. The electrolytes must have a high ionic conductivity. Generally, the ionic conductivity around 10 to power of negative three semen per centimeter is uh, sufficient enough to produce a good efficiency performance. And then excellent interfacial contact with electron. So this is where we need to use like a gel type polymer plates where they can stick very well with the other component. So it will give you a very good uh, contact which will enhance the performance of the device. And have a long life cycle performance for practical usage too. And no effect to the visible light absorption of the cell. Okay, what are the main problem with the common Dyson size solar cell? So generally people use liquid electrolytes as an electrolyte. When we use that, leakages can occur, desorption, and they can easily volatilize and also the corrosion at the platinum electrode. So all these are drawbacks to make the usage of liquid electrolytes in DSSC will affect the performance of the devices. So to overcome these uh, issues, we try to use solid polymer electrolytes. When solid polymer electrolytes is used, the main problem will be the low ionic conductivity at room temperature. Even though they show high conductivity at higher temperature, but at room temperature, they generally show low ionic conductivity. And also since like a polymer electrodes are a bit dry, so they will show a very poor contact between the electrodes. So to overcome that, in our studies, we are using gel type polymer electrodes, where this gel type of polymer electrodes will show higher ionic conductivity, excellent contact, low vapor pressure, and also the excellent thermal stability. Okay, one of the main weakness of the gel polymer electrolytes are they contain only salt based, which will show low ionic conductivity and efficiency compared to the liquid electrolytes. Even though the safety is uh, overcome, but the efficiency will be still uh, low. So there are two approaches we use to overcome this. The first one is by using gel polymer electrolytes with a different size cation of iodide salt. The other way is to, by using the sonicated nanoparticles. So the incorporation of these sonicated nanoparticles into the uh, polymer with the iodide salt will enhance the uh, conductivity and also the efficiency of the DSSC. The host polymer, generally people use homopolymer and copolymer. But in this study, we are using like a third polymer. So like uh, generally we know homopolymer are the polymers made up from identical monomer, whereas copolymer will produce from the copolymerization will be made up of a two different type of monomer. So the third polymer normally we use like a three or more type of monomer. So in our, in our study, we are using like a three monomer type. So when we use like a three different type of monomer to produce a third polymer, so the each properties of the each monomer will be shown by the third polymer where we can have a compromised properties of a three monomers that are used in the polymerization process. So in our studies or the studies that I'm going to share with you all, we are using polyvinyl butyryl, covinyl alcohol, covinyl acetate. So each of these monomers uh, will have their unique properties where vinyl butyryl are able to provide flexibility and toughness, whereas vinyl alcohol will possess like a multi-hydroxyl group, which is an excellent uh, mechanical strength properties, at the same time can give like a good conduction properties. And vinyl acetase will show good amorphous region, and generally it is well-known fact that ionic conductivity and the performance of the device based on efficiency will be enhanced 
if the percentage of amorphous region in the polymer is higher. Okay, now why we are using copper oxide? Copper oxide generally have the low thermal expansion and also cost effective and environmental benignity and narrow band gap. And in this study, we are using like a solo chemical method. This solo chemical method is like a simple and straightforward method that could mitigate the negative effects of high temperature calcination on metal oxide. So here we are using like a acoustic cavitations where bubble will be formed and then this will be uh, giving us a much better property. So the synthesized nanoparticles which based on these bubbles are stable nanoparticles and also high yield. And also we can vary the size of the nanoparticles which is below 100 nanometer. Okay, here the type of salt that we are using are sodium iodide and TPI, which is a tetrapropyl ammonium iodide. So the reason we are using iodide salt in this proposed study is because the dye that we are using is a iodine dye. And then we are uh, incorporating the nanoparticles inside the uh, salt base system. And at the end, we fabricate the solar cell. So we can see the concentration of the sodium iodide is varied from 10 to 48%, whereas the TPI salt is varied from the 10 to 58%. So the method is shown here where we can stir the mixture to get the gel polymer electrolytes. So the gel polymer electrolytes, the, what you call the, the shape is compared with the water here. Okay, then for copper oxide nanoparticles, we can see the sonication at about uh, 60 minutes. And before that, we need to stir for 30 minutes and centrifugation will be uh, processed. And then calcination to the precipitation obtained was dry. And we calcine at 350 degrees Celsius for three hours to produce the copper oxide nanoparticles. Generally, the weight percentage of copper oxide nanoparticles cannot be too high. So that is what we can see here. The maximum copper oxide nanoparticles that we use in our studies is about 9.8%. So here is the, the method to fabricate the DSSC. So for working electrode, we have like a two layers, where the first layer, we use like a titanium oxide with the nitric acid, and we use a spin coating method where the sintering will be used to at 450 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. And the second layer will be made by uh, Dr. Blade method and also the same temperature and the duration for the sintering. And then it will be immersed in the dye solution for 24 hours. So the picture of the working electrode is shown here. Then counter electrodes were prepared by the chloroplanetic acid mixture with the ethanol solution. And the drop the solution onto the FTO glass. And again, the sintering will be occurred and it will repeat it until desired platinum electrode is obtained. Then the DSSC will be assembled. Okay, some of the characterization I will share with you. So uh, this is a cold cold plot and we can see that uh, we will get like a semicircle at a high frequency region. And from this cold cold plot, we can measure the bulk resistance of the material and this will be used to calculate the conductivity of the material. And results clearly shows that TPAI system shows higher ionic conductivity compared to the sodium iodide. So the reason again being is TPI has the uh, higher atomic size of cation, and this will decrease the lattice energy of the system. When this happens, the degree of dissociation and density of free ion will increase us. So this will automatically increase the ionic conductivity of the system. And here the temperature dependent ionic conductivity is conducted to study on the mechanism. And we found all the systems obey the RNS behavior where ions are based on the hoping mechanisms. And we can also observe the activation energy decreases for the high ionic conductivity due to the lower potential barrier. And this will increase the transportation of the ion, hence the ionic conductivity. And then here we show some XRD results. 
And we also can uh, observe here that uh, the highest conducting TPA system shows shorter coherent length compared to the highest conducting NAI system. And these two systems, since the highest conducting system from the both their own respective uh, sol. So this is uh, mentioned because both of these uh, are showing a very uh, uh, like a promising amorphous nature of the electrolyte. And then the charge density when increases, so this will produce like a strong inter and intermolecular crosslink of polymer chain, which will increase the viscosity. And this effect will reduce the mobility of ions in the electrolytes. When we observe like uh, the charge density become lesser, so this is a totally opposite to the uh, initial cases. And then now I show you all some photovoltaic studies and results shows the TPA system, which shows the higher ionic conductivity compared to the sodium iodide, will have a higher efficiency, which is about 3.26%. Okay, next, the results on the copper oxide. So the FESCM images shows that the copper oxide downloaded size are from 0 0.38 micrometer to 2.57 micrometer. And the EDX spectrum shows the presence of the copper and oxide clearly. And also we can see the EDX images where the red color represent the oxygen and the yellow color represent the copper. And the picture clearly shows the presence of both the copper and oxygen. Okay, here. The incorporation of the copper oxide nanoparticles improves the ionic conductivity where we obtain about 2.48 and center power of negative three cement per centimeter with the incorporation of the true weight percent of the copper oxide. And initial conduction increases due to the copper oxide on a particles disturb the polymer chain and create a void for more ion transportation. Whereas at a higher concentration of the nanoparticles, agglomeration occurs, and this hinder the ionic mobility and also the conductivity. Okay, the XRD result shows even shorter coherent length compared to the TPI and NAI system to show the percentage of the amorphous nature in the copper oxide nanoparticles incorporated system is much higher. And we also can observe the efficiency of the systems is up to 6.38%. It's almost double compared to the sol added system. So we can see this happens because the ion diffusion increases along bridge nanoparticle network. And this also due to the dye regeneration kinetics increases. Okay, in conclusion, we can summarize that TPI and sodium iodide salt uh, are investigated, where TPI have higher ionic conductivity. This is due to the bulky cation and lower lattice energy. And then the incorporation of the sonicated copper oxide on a particle provide highest ionic conductivity and at the same time, the highest photo conversion efficiency of 6.38%. So these are the references that we use for these studies. And with that, thank you for listening to the uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ramesh, for your presentation. Uh, I would like to remind the participants, if you have any question, please write it down. At the end of the session, you will be allowed to ask the question. Uh, now the time is for Prof. Andrea for her presentation. Prof. Andrea from, uh, she is the scientific director of the Brazilian Materials Research Society. So uh, the floor is yours, Prof. Andrea. You have Thank maybe 15 to 20 minutes, maximum 20 minutes for the presentation, please, if you can you. consider that. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Good. So first of all, uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening for some of you. 
Uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this event for the opportunity to participate. It's really a great honor for me to be among such distinguished speakers. I have heard already some very inspiring talks. So thank you very much, Amal, for this invitation. So my name is Andrea de Camargo. I come from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Currently, I'm working on a sabbatical in Germany at the University of Münster. But uh, normally, this is where I am. So I lead a group on luminescent and optical materials that is called the Laboratory of Spectroscopy of Functional Materials. And uh, among our research interests, which are many, uh, we actually have very diversified research on luminescent and optical materials that go from the betterment of solar harvesting in uh, photovoltaic uh, solar cells to lighting devices, you know, uh, bioimaging and photodynamic therapy. And more recently, we have been in, uh, interested in optical sensors as well. So our approach to these materials is to design meso and anoscopic host gas uh, materials in which the gas can be, for instance, a metallic complex from the F and E blocks, organic dyes or quantum dots, or even metallic nanoparticles. And the host can be mesoporosilicates or organosilicates, clays like bentonite and laconite, core shell nanoparticles as well, and biopolymers. So why do we want to make host gas systems? So uh, there is a number of advantages in doing that. For one thing, you can grant protection to the molecular species that are usually quenched by external agents, such as uh, uh, molecular oxygen, for instance. You can also avoid toxic leakage in biological applications. You have a more flexible platform for applications in nanofilm or uh, nanoparticles. You also can increase dispersion and solubility of the luminescent species. You might grant biocompatibility. And sometimes you might even derive new properties from the synergy of the host and the gas. So you actually get a new property where there wasn't in the independent parts of the system. So we have been using several approaches for that uh, to promote the interaction between host and gas. So for instance, we have here columbic interaction where you have uh, cationic species such as this iridium complex I'm showing. And then we use a sodium aluminum silicate host. And then basically sodium gets out and the complex gets in and you have columbic interaction. Another approach would be to promote uh, pi pi stacking, van der Waals interaction between uh, the aromatic rings of uh, a guest in an organosilicate host, such as this phenyl silicate that you can see here. Yet another approach would be self-assembly. We start from a micellar system where we mix surfactant complexes as the one you can see here with CTAB, uh, which is the surfactant normally used to make hexagonal pores uh, of silica in MCM41. And then you mix the complex with the uh, with CTAB, the surfactant, you get a micellar system. And then by addition of the silica precursor, you can have very structured MCM41 in which the complex molecules are on the walls of the structure here. And finally, we can promote what we call ship in a bottle approach when we actually assemble the whole complex inside the guest um, silicate, uh, for instance, and we can do that because, uh, as you probably know, the silicate surface has a lot of hydroxyl groups, so it gives you a broad uh, opportunity for uh, functionalization. So for the past five years, we have been very interesting, interested in this heteroleptic iridium complexes here. These complexes, they present uh, very interesting characteristics, such as high emission quantum yields, fairly short lifetime, that ranges from 0.1 to 1.5 microseconds, and a variety of colors that can be tuned by appropriate choice of the ligands. So if you have a good um, chemist that can do molecular engineering and design the right ligands, you can really tune and play with the photophysics of the complex. And of course, 
All these uh, advantages will lead to applications in lighting devices, such as OLEDs and uh, electroluminescent cells, PDT, photodynamic therapy, or photocatalytic generation of hydrogen and bioimaging as well. So we have been studying some of these complexes that you can see here. We're not gonna go into the tail of the chemistry, but you might recognize here we have bipyridine ligands. This one has fluorines also. And then they have these long uh, nine carbon tails here. And when we look at the photophysics of this complex in, um, in methanol solution, what we can see here is that for air equilibrated conditions, the quantum yield of this uh, complex ranges from three to 9%. Right? So that's the quantum yield. So one thing that I didn't mention to you, the reason why these complexes are very efficient is because they can actually harvest triplet and sing singlet excitons. So they are triplet emitters. And as any triplet emitter, they are sensible to the presence of molecular oxygen. So as you can see, if we go to nitrogen saturated conditions here, the quantum yield that was three to 9% in air equilibrated condition actually can range, can get up to 89% in this particular complex here. And if you go to oxygen saturated conditions, you can clearly see the effect of quenching here. So, of course, we don't want to make a cell uh, and work under nitrogen saturated conditions. I would like to have a device that operates in air equilibrated conditions. One approach to counter this problem then is to encapsulate this iridium complex molecules in mesoporous hexagonal silica. I have already mentioned this approach to you. So we basically add the complex molecules in the micellar solution and then we get, for instance, MPM41, hexagonal uh, structured um, silica containing these uh, mole molecules. So as you can see here, we have spherical particles of about 200 to 300 nanometers typically, and there are hexagonal pores that contain the molecules uh, on the walls. And here you can see the colors of the three complexes we have studied. If we compare now the complexes in solution and in the materials that were prepared uh, after incorporation of them in the silica host, you can see that in general, there's a little shift to the blue to more or less extent, and that is perfectly normal. And it's due to the hygiochromic effect that affects the stabilization of the excited state. So a little bit of a shift to the blue so that our complexes emit in the bluish to yellow region, and uh, they are quite efficient. Again, if we look at the, at the photophysics here, and now we are comparing the iridium complexes in solution and in the solid hosts, you can see now for air equilibrated conditions that we actually have an improve already just by doing the encapsulation in the solid host. Huh? And if you go, to nitrogen uh, uh, condition here, saturated condition, you can see there's not much of an improvement because this is pretty much uh, what, what we, this is where we can see the biggest improvement here, probably here, uh, the access uh, uh, to the pores is not so facilitated anymore. And of course, in oxygen uh, saturated conditions, the numbers are much worse. Now, if we look at lifetimes, you can see that before they were ranging from 0 0.6 to 2.3 microseconds, whereas now in the solid materials, you actually have components that range from 1.9 to 3.5 microseconds. This is quite an improvement. You can see here, there's a second component of the lifetime, and that's probably due to molecules that are more exposed to oxygen on the external surfaces. Now, more recently, in fact, uh, right now I have a student working at the University of Münster, also in the group of Professor Christian Strasser, and she's working on uh, organosilicate hosts incorporating new platinum complexes and also iridium complexes. They're both triplet emitters, and they're very interesting for uh, biophotonics and also for lighting devices or 
uh, any other technological device. So this is current work going on here. We have some new platinum complexes that were specifically designed to exhibit very high quantum yield in the thrustered group. So uh, this iridium complex, uh, uh, they are also interesting for bioimaging, but the problem is that they are highly toxic. Huh? So for example, we have prepared some chloride salts of our complexes and they are soluble in water, but the problem is they have high toxicity and therefore cannot be used for biological applications in solution. Now, one way to mask toxicity is also to incorporate them in the solid host, as I have mentioned. So the approach here was to do incorporation in laponite. Laponite is a nanoclate, I'm gonna show you soon. And once you incorporate the complex, the PF, uh, the complex with PF6 counter ion in laponite, then we grant high solubility, high emission efficiency, and most important, no toxicity. So here's laponite, I wanted to show you. It's made up of little discs of 25 nanometers and approximately one nanometer thickness. This is the composition. And this is the surface area here around 370 square meters per gram. So basically what we do, we have our complex here with the counter ion PF6, and then we load this into the laponite nanodisc. Huh? And then we can see that the before unsoluble complex now is totally soluble in solution in water. And that of course is good for bioimaging. Here we have a comparison of the chlorine chloride samples that are soluble in water already. And here the laponite materials. And if we look at quantum yield again, I always like to show you the air equilibrated um, the air equilibrated numbers here, because this makes more sense. It ranges from three to 47% in solution. Whereas when you incorporate the complex in laponite, it actually goes from eight up to 92%, depending on the complex. And if you look at the oxygen saturated conditions, there's also an improvement here. Most important of all is that the quenching rate here is quite lower in the solid material than it is for the solution. So the interesting thing about this work here is that now iridium complexes can be used for bioimaging, but of course we had to perform uh, text, uh, tests uh, for toxicity. And for that, we have used the three approaches. We have measured mitochondrial activity, cell adhesion, and also microscopic images. This was a paper that was published in ACS Applied My, uh, Materials Interfaces in 2018. I was quite proud of this paper because it was our first attempt to apply our materials to biophotonics. So here you can see that um, for, we have tested in three different concentrations here. So one, two, and three corresponds to the complex in solution and let one, two, and three is actually the material we have prepared here. So we have tested these three concentrations of two, four, and eight micromolar. And for lab one, as you can see here, we see high cell viability. So what we're looking at here is cell viability for lab one, you can see 100% here, high cell vi vi viability, whereas for the complex in solution, it's really toxic, as you can see. And for lab two and lab three, we can also see very high cell viability huh? and the, the viability of the cells with the other complex in solution varies, but you can see it's lower than for the laponite uh, as you increase the concentration. And that's for mitochondrial activity. Similar behavior is seen here in cell adhesion. But what's most interesting here is that if you look at the numbers, we see not only that the cells survive the presence of the laponite material, but they also reproduce. So you have an increase here of more than 100% in proliferation of the cells in the presence of the laponite materials. You can also see here 
the materials that are incorporated with lab two, they actually sell a higher concentration of cells. So basically, loading the complex in laponite masks cytotoxicity of iridium complex. You can see high cell viabilities, improves photophysics and stability, and also offers perspective of passive targeting of tumor cells for PDT. In a previous paper, we had already investigated this possibility using laponite with uh, silicon phthalocyanine. Silicon phthalocyanine is known and largely used for PDT experiments. However, it's a molecule that is not very soluble in solution. So again, when you do the combination of the host and gas here, you actually reach a, a material that has awesome water solubility, very good indeed. And the photophysics of the active molecule is conserved in the solid, this LS10 here, as much as it is in solution. So the next step in this study here was to use the materials that were prepared uh, to treat breast cancer cells or to perform photodynamic therapy of the cells. So here you can see the incorporation of the nanodisks into the cells. The cells were MC. F7. And here you can see better images of the red fluorescence of the nanoclay itself. And here the MCF7 breast cancer cell line. And here you see a merge. And you can clearly see that the laponite uh, uh, actually get uh, successfully into the cells and accumulate around the nucleus. So next step again was to look at the biological experiment and exam cell viability. So the first four columns you see here correspond to um, studies of cell viability in the dark. So there's no light shining or exciting uh, the phthalocyanine here. So basically we have here cells that were just doped with laponite without the complex for these two columns. And you can see the viability is very high, meaning laponite alone is not toxic at all for the cells. So we have different concentrations of laponite. Now here we have laponite loaded with the complex in two different concentrations. Right? But again, since we are in the dark, there's no excitation. So the cell viability is also very high, close to 100%. There is no toxicity here. This is a control experiment where only light was shining on the cells. So there was no material incorporated. And here you have your just laponite incorporated with light shining on. And finally, you have here two columns corresponding to the laponite with complex in different concentrations. And as you can see, cell viability is practically zero. So very efficient photodynamic therapy, only 0.3% uh, cells survived here. And we can also see that the synergy of host and gas in this case led to very low dark toxicity and high biocompatibility of the material. Do I still have time? I have two or three more slides. Am I okay? So if, if nobody stops me, I yes, will please. briefly talk. You still have time. Yes. Yeah, I have only three slides. I will briefly talk about more recent work on nanoparticles. We also do a lot of studies on upconverting nanoparticles. Basically, for those who are not familiar, if any, they are uh, particles such as fluoride, like uh, yttrium or sodium uh, fluoride nanoparticles that are doped with rare earth ions, such as erbium, tulium, ytterbium. Right? So these particles, they have the ability to absorb infrared light and convert them into visible light, depending on the ion you do the doping with. There is a number of combinations of ions that you can use to achieve emission in several different wavelengths here. We have been working with erbium and tulium, particularly erbium has emissions in the green and in the red. So we're gonna focus on this one first. What is the advantage of uh, exciting in near infrared? Well, for biological applications, this is actually essential because you promote low photon damage of bio tissues when you do excitation in the infrared. You also have weak background fluorescence, higher signal to noise ratio, 
higher penetration depth and low cytotoxicity. And then the applications can be many from drug delivery to PDT, bioimaging, and photodynamic ther therapy of bacteria as well. So our initial idea was to prepare an upconverting nanoparticle containing erbium ions that would yield red and green emission, and then to cover this with a silica layer that can be mesoporous or dense, right? And then on this silica layer here, do functionalization to attach molecules such as silicon phthalocyanine, which are uh, interesting for photodynamic therapy. So here's the goal. We can excite with near infrared light, promote green and red emission, and the red emission can be used to excite the uh, molecules on the surface here. And in the presence of oxygen, you would have generation of uh, singlet oxygen, reactive species, and then you could promote photodynamic inactivation of bacteria or any other microorganism. And you could also use the green, of course, for bioimaging. So we have here a multifunctional nanoparticle. Of course, it's easier said than done because it's very important to uh, control the spacing between this active molecule here and the erbium ion. And for that, we have prepared a series of samples with different spacing, uh, spacer groups here in the, in the binding of the phthalocyanide and also different um, thickness of the silica layer. So here are some examples uh, we have. First of all, we started with cubic nanoparticles they were approximately 45 nanometers diameter with a surface area of 35 meters squared per gram. But once we do the covering, the shell with silica, then the diameter goes doubled. It's about 100 nanometers, pore size 2.4 nanometers. The surface area increased quite a bit because the silica shell was mesoporous. So this work was conducted by one of my PhD students in collaboration with Dr. Natalia Inada, who is a, a, pharma a pharmacist working in our institute also and who gives the input of the biological testing to our group. So what you can see here is this material, the upconverting nanoparticles with the silica shell in the powder form. And the nice thing is that in solution now, you can also see the emission quite well in the green and in the red. That's the emission of erbium. Whereas before adding the silica layer, you basically don't see any emission. So adding the silica layer actually protects the erbium ion from being quenched from hydroxyl groups. And that's why we can see nice emission. Here's a nice image of the, the, the particles we have. And then the tests we did were with E. coli. And um, yeah, were with E. coli. I think this is S. aureus bacteria. There's a mistake here. I apologize for that. Um, but anyways, this, is, this should be S. aureus. And what we did here is a series of control experiments with the different nanoparticles in the dark and using light. And again, this is cell viability. So you can see here that some of the particles are more or less efficient, but we were able to get efficient photodynamic therapy when the excitation was done directly in the photosensitizer, in the silicon phthalocyanide. However, as I told you, our main goal would be to produce red light from erbium nanoparticle and then see this red light transferring to the phthalocyanide. And we also carried out experiments like that. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is E. coli indeed. The idea is to compare here excite, direct excitation and indirect excitation at the nanoparticle that should excite the phthalocyanide. Here we also see some efficient of photodynamic therapy, but obviously less efficient than in this case here, when we could actually eliminate totally. And so the reason for this is that we have not been able to optimize yet the right distancing between thalocyanine and erbium ion for uh, optimal energy transfer.
But more recently, this student, uh, I told you she's a PhD student. The first work was done as she was doing her master's project, but now- Sorry, in Prof. Her Andrea, PhD... sorry, Prof. Andrea, your time is complete. If you could please complete within one minute. Yes, this is the last one then. This is just an idea that I want to show you, okay? So the idea here is to prepare a selective sensor for bacteria using this upconversion nanoparticles uh, to make a turn on sensor. So it's a cool idea. I think I wanna share with you. So basically we have here the nanoparticles with tulium and erbium. And this nanoparticles, they normally would emit at, uh, in the green and in the blue, okay, for tulium. However, in the presence of quenching agents such as gold nanorods or graphene, they totally quench. There is a very efficient energy transfer of the nanoparticles and then you see no luminescence at all, okay? So what we plan to do is to functionalize the surface. Okay, it's, you stopped my screen sharing. Can you, can you let me continue? And I'm just about to finish. My screen sharing was paused. We can see it. I can see the screen actually. Yeah, but I cannot move. Okay, no. here you go. So we are going to functionalize this uh, nanoparticles with erbium to bind to gram positive bacteria, whereas the others will be functionalized to bind to gram negative bacteria. So remember, I see no luminescence at all because there's quenching here transfer to the gold nanorods. However, in the pres presence of gram negative bacteria, they will link to this particular nanoparticle with tulium, which is functionalized for that. And then this particle will be free with the mobility of the bacteria. And then I will see luminescence of tulium, whereas the erbium luminescence will still be quenched. Same idea for gram positive, then I will see emission of erbium and not of tulium. And if we have a mixture, then we can see both. And the idea is that you can collect the, the response of the system using your smartphone and can make a cheap paper-based nanosensor. So here is pictures of the nanoparticles. I don't have time to talk about that. So I would like to introduce to you my research group think uh, because they are the ones who actually do the hard work and also would like to thank uh, the collaborator I have mentioned, uh, Natalia Inada. And finally, uh, I take this opportunity to congratulate all the women in the room for the International Women's Day. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Andrea, for your presentation. Now, uh, next presenter will be uh, Prof. Amal Kasri from Egypt, from the British University in Egypt. Uh, the title of uh, her presentation will be Structure Manipulation for the Development of Highly Sensitive Nano Biosensing Technologies. So the floor is yours, Prof. Amal. Please, Thank you very uh, much. Consider yeah. the time is 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you very uh, much. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Professor Andrea, could you please unshare the screen so I can share mine? Mm -hmm. I thought I had this stopped. How should I do this? I thought I had stopped my screen. Okay, stop share. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Is it with the uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the organizers and uh, especially Dr. Amal Amin, of course, for uh, the kind invitation. I'm going to talk about uh, some points uh, re related to the research of my group at the moment, which uh, is uh, uh, mainly about biosensing. So I'm going to talk about highly sensitive optical and electrical nano biosensing techniques based on graphene uh, nanomembranes. Before I start uh, about the technical part, I would like just to speak uh, about uh, uh, how I feel about this meeting, because actually I, I wish I could be in Iraq at the moment. I, uh, I wish it could have been a, a physical meeting in the hook. And I was searching a little bit about the city and how it looks like, and I found very amazing, beautiful pictures. Um, I really hope one day uh, I will be there, if not for a conference, just for, for a visit. And uh, I was looking also how far it is from here. So I am now in Cairo, 
So it's like 26 hours of drive, which is actually, actually not so bad. So <laughs> maybe one day we can do this trip. Uh, now we go back from the hook to Cairo and uh, just briefly about the British University in Egypt is uh, located at the north or east of Cairo. It's about 40, 40 kilometers from the center of Cairo. Uh, the BUE was established about 15 years ago and now it has 11 faculties and 12 research centers. The uh, Nanotechnology Research Center, which I am currently the director of, is one of these 12. It was established, it was launched in 2016 and uh, started functioning two years ago in 20, uh, early 2019. Uh, now we host, uh, we are a uh, place for about five or six uh, actually different research groups. Uh, my research group is working in the field of biosensing. We also have uh, polymer-based application, cancer therapy and virology catalysis uh, and molecular dynamic uh, simulation, which we use a lot for our uh, biosensing also. Uh, so, uh, since the main topic of my research is biosensors, so just briefly, uh, I'm sure all of us use the sensing uh, mechanisms in, in a way or another, or for example, uh, detecting the sugar level in blood. This is very a popular machine. Uh, there has been a lot of um, uh, progress actually in designing sensors to be very small, to be implanted uh, in the body or in the teeth to monitor the hygiene and the health in general. Also, uh, veterinary and agriculture diseases can be detected with some high sensitivity biosensors. So we focus on developing very high sensitivity sensing mechanisms. Uh, and uh, to know that or to speak about this, uh, just briefly, what is a biosensor? It has to be uh, there are three main parts uh, related to biosensing. The first is the analyte. So you need to uh, know what exactly you, you want to detect. The second part is the transducer, which is the mechanism. It could be electrical, optical, mechanical, and then the signal, which is dependent, or the detector, which is dependent for, very much on the transducer. There is a very important thing related to biosensing, which is the interface. Uh, the interface here between the transducer and the analyte um, uh, defines uh, how specific the, sen the, sen the sensor would be. So we work mostly with surface biosensors, so it's very important for us to work uh, carefully on the surface chemistry in order to make the sensor specific for the analyte that we want to detect. Uh, and of course, it's our dream that to have uh, to have sensor which are highly sensitive, but also very small that can be used easily either by consumers or by medical doctors. This takes me to the outline. So I'm going to speak about three different main things. First, surface plasma as as a famous example for highly sensitive biosensors. And then our efforts to move from the optical technique to also optical or electrical technique, but working more on the material, how to make the material highly sensitive. And this is mainly graphene. Uh, so if I speak first about surface plasmon as one of the popular uh, surface sensors, uh, surface plasmons in general plasmonics is the collective oscillation of free electrons on the surface of a metal like gold free uh, free electrons oscillate, and due to this uh, strong oscillation, they form what we call evanescent field. This evanescent field is associated always with the surface, so it peaks at the interface as we see, as we see here, and then it decays exponentially as we go further. Uh, this is the phenomena which is very well known uh, from everyone who studies physics and chemistry as well. Uh, however, like this, we cannot use it for sensing. To use it for sensing, we need to manipulate somehow the configuration of this. We do that by very simple method. There are different ways to do that. This is an example. So we have our metal layer where we have our free, free electrons. And then uh, if we look at the dispersion, uh, if we look at the frequency of this oscillation as a function of the wave vector, we see that there is no matching between them. Once we introduce a very high refractive index uh, medium, like a prism, for example, we do a manipulation. We manipulate the momentum of the free uh, of the incident light, and then we have a matching point. This matching point will depend very much on the frequency of the incident light. So let us say we have it here, for example. So this means that at this point is what we call resonance. Resonance means that all the energy from the incident light is absorbed by the free electrons in the metal layer. And then we have this very low reflected uh, light if we want to measure the reflectivity here. Why we can use this as a sensor? Because this phenomena is happening here at the interface. So it's a very sensitive to any change happening here. So once we modify our surface, we have uh, uh, the, the dispersion of the frequency uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the plasmonic change, and then we have a new coupling point, and then we have a shift. 
from this shift, we can actually know a lot of information about what's happening here on the surface. So if we bind another molecule, then we have another shift and so on. So this helps us not only to study the interaction between proteins, but also to study each layer individually so we can have information about the surface density and we can also uh, know, uh, do real-time interaction, real-time measurements, so we can measure the interaction between two proteins in real time. So this is very useful, and there was actually a lot of companies actually that had developed the sensor based on uh, this, uh, this concept. Uh, so uh, I will show you just one quick example that we did recently, uh, that we managed to design uh, the sensor to detect a cardiovascular, uh, one of the cardiovascular biomarker, which is troponin, uh, CTNI CT detection or troponin det detection with very high sensitivity uh, can be very helpful for long-term help of different patient groups, including patients with heart failure and accuracy coronary syndrome, acute uh, coronary syndrome. This is important for people who suffer from heart diseases. Uh, it wasn't easy to do a direct interaction between the protein and the surface, so we did. Uh, we started to do some molecular dynamic simulation to study the the, the protein uh, structure, and then uh, we managed to do uh, the surface design in such a way that the protein can be the epitope in the protein can be exposed to bind directly to the antibody. And as you see here, we could reach a limit of detection of about 19 picomolar, and this is within the clinical range. So this sensor actually is quite high. This is using fluorescence, and it's a very high sensitivity sensor for troponin, which is very promising to help people who suffer from heart disease at early stage before it gets worse. Uh, so this was recently done, actually, in collaboration with Austrian Institute of Technology. And now I will move, uh, because of the time, uh, I will move to how we uh, started manipulating uh, some different materials in order to have uh, cheap and easy to use uh, sensors. And I will do this uh, re uh, related to, uh, I will speak about what we did related to graphene. Why graphene? Because graphene, since it was um, started to be a famous material in 2004, as you all know, uh, it has a zero band gap semiconductor. It has a conduction and valence band are defined by two in equivalent set of direct points. Uh, it has this linear dependence of energy on its wave vector. It has also enhanced interband and intraband transition widths, which actually uh, uh, enhances the optical properties of the graphene. Uh, since it was known uh, or since it was isolated, uh, there have been a lot of progress in the manufacturing methods. So now you can deposit uh, graphene uh, with different methods on any substrate, specifically the flexible one. So this is useful for uh, either for uh, flexible electronics or also in the field of healthcare if you want to do small and easy to use sensors, for example. So we started, as I said in the beginning, one of the most important thing is the interface, how to modify the surface. It was challenging to modify graphene surface uh, simply because uh, the graphene, uh, as it is, has no binding site. It's, a, it's, it's basically a single layer of graphite, so there is no binding site there. So we needed to do to uh, play around that by uh, doing uh, electrostatic interaction. So we synthesized this molecule. Uh, which is diazonium, and this, if it comes in contact with the graphene, it leads to an electron transfer, so it, by, it, it constitutes a kind of electrostatic uh, complex, and this is quite stable. And on the other side, you can uh, functionalize this with any functional group you want, so you can make it a specific for the, for the proteins that you want to detect, for example. This was a test, so this was just a simple biotin streptavidin test, so we uh, functionalized the diazonium with biotin, and then we did also we put the graphene on a metal layer, and we monitor the bind. We monitor the binding using surface plasmon. So you see here the binding here, and then after washing, and this difference between the baseline and the signal indicates that the binding indeed took place successfully. And then we bound our protein, and we see that we are forming quite a stable layer. This was just the test of how to use graphene if we want to use it for sensing, if we can modify the surface or not. But how to use graphene as a sensor? As I said, graphene is just flat. It has no binding site. It has no gap. So you cannot actually use it uh, successfully. Uh, and to overcome this problem, we came out with the idea that what about if we uh, is, uh, try to uh, create a gap in the graphene in order to use it either for electrical or optical sensing. So you can have this on-off function. 
So uh, by doing these uh, simulations with uh, my colleague Ahmed Maruf, and we patented this idea in 2015. So if you remove some atoms from the graphene, the, you create a gap because it's like you are stealing some of the energy of the state. So you create the gap, and then by uh, functionalizing the edges of this gap, of the hole with different uh, molecules, you can actually control this gap. And by doing this, you can use it for sensing if something binds to uh, the, the gap. Uh, there will be a charge transfer, and that's why we call the charge sensor, and then the gap will change it, and this change can be experimentally monitored either electrically or optically. This was the simulation. It took us several years, actually, to do this experimentally, because it's very hard to create such a small hole. This was done in a very small scale. So it, we kept trying for several, several years. This is what we wanted to achieve, basically. Uh, after uh, many different, different uh, unsuccessful tries, finally, three years ago, we managed to do that. So this was our aim, to have the hole and then bind the protein to it and then monitor this binding. Uh, and to, in 2017, we collaborated with the Melbourne Center for Nanofabrication and we managed to come up with the, uh, this uh, simple and nice idea. So we start with CVD graphene layer. We uh, uh, deposit a very thin layer of gold. This is like less than 10 nanometer, according to the properties of the gold at this very low thickness. You have uh, you don't have a continuous layer. You have like islands, and if you anneal this, uh, it shrinks more. So you actually decrease the size of these islands even further. So we control the size by controlling the annealing temperature and time. And then you protect the rest with a very thin chromium layer, and then you etch the gold, then etch the uh, chromium, and then you end up with this uh, nice uh, graphene layer with holes as confirmed by the AFM. Right, now we managed to do this. So how, again, how to use this for sensing. Uh, the challenge here was that, are we going to see a change in the uh, optical or electrical properties, for example? First, we wanted to see what's happening on the edges here. And to do that, we used the near field imaging, which we call Neostom, Neosnom, I'm sorry. This is basically, it's like exactly like the AFM. We all know the AFM, so you have a tip. And then there is a laser source hitting this tip. The tip confines the, the light and hits the surface. And then the scattered light, due to this strong confinement, the scattered light is monitored by a detector. And if, we, if there is a resonance, have an, our idea here is that if we excite, uh, if we create this gap, then we definitely have free electrons. And if we can excite them, then we excite localized the plasmonics here in these edges. And if we have plasmonics and resonance, then we can use it as a sensor. Uh, and this is what we, what we tried using this uh, near field imaging a microscope. And we could see that here, if you see that these are the results, so we start with just a graphene layer without any holes, and we shine it with 11.1 uh, micrometer laser. And these four ones are our membrane, the one with the holes at uh, different wavelengths. And you see that with, enhance, with increasing the wavelength, the signal is, keeps enhance, enhanced, and the maximum was here at 11.1. This is where the resonance uh, took place. And then by increasing further, it goes down. And you can see maybe this is, the clearest one where you can see the edges here was very strong, uh, a very strong signal. You cannot differentiate it so much because this, the, the diameter was very small. So the diameter was about 20 nanometer and the, the center to center distance was about uh, 40 to 45 nanometer. So this uh, nice uh, measurement uh, proved to us that yes, we can actually uh, create or we can excite localized plasmonics in graphene uh, membrane or graphene nanomesh or graphene with holes. These are different names. We did uh, to prove our uh, work uh, theoretically, we ran some simulation uh, in collaboration with the AUC here in Egypt so with Professor Swedland, and he uses uh, the finite difference time domain method. Uh, this is, I will not go in details of the simulation, uh, but basically it's uh, like a discrete, uh, so the, the layer is uh, divided to different uh, cubes and then he uses uh, Maxwell equations to fit this. And our results here, the theoretical results, luckily, or uh, I mean, it was good that it was uh, uh, in good, very good agreement actually with the experiment. So uh, here is the, this is our experimental results here. This is the graphene on quartz and this is the graphene dot uh, low dubbed, I mean, uh, with the holes. So you see here, this is at 11.1 uh, 
and it agrees very well also with the wavelengths that we saw the resonance at uh, in these images as you see here. So the experiment was and the theoretical work was uh, uh, matched very well. And then we kept playing with to understand more about the configuration. So we changed the distance between the holes, we changed the diameter of the holes, and we could um, very nicely see a shift in the resonance when we change the distance or the diameter. So this proved to us, this was like a further uh, proof that yes, we can excite localized plasmonics in the graphene. Also, it's a localized because if we come with different incident angle, we see that all the resonance happens at the same wavelength. Uh, also, the simulation of the field intensity, you see here, these are the edges, so it's very strong at the edge, and then it fades as you go further. So uh, we were very happy with these results, and now, uh, theoretically, we also proved that we can use it for sensing. We just imagine that we have these holes, the graphene with holes, and we uh, uh, mimicked the change, uh, the binding of the protein, we mimicked it by changing the refractive index. So we changed the refractive index from 1.33 to 1.45, and as you see the results here, we can see a shift and the resonance every time we change the sensor, the slope was 825, which is comparable to uh, uh, sensors at this wavelength. So the idea here, if we can do this experimentally, we are, we are actually very close to do this experimentally. So my student now, Mona, is working on uh, modifying these edges selectively, selectively actually modifying the edges and to bind the protein. We are very close to uh, publish this soon. So uh, the, another example I will mention, which is also based on graphene sensor for pH sensor. So what about if we have the holes that I mentioned, but with nanoparticles embedded inside these holes? What would that be? Our idea here or our hypothesis was that uh, there should be a coupling between the plasmonics of the particles and the plasmonics from the graphene. And this should enhance the sensitivity even further. And to do that, we, uh, for in this case, it was an electrical pH sensor based on CMOS, metal oxide semiconductor. So this is the configuration. We start with aluminum and uh, silicon, P-type silicon, then silicon oxide, very thin layer. And then our hybrid, this we call a hybrid. So it's a graphene with the nanoparticle embedded in each of these holes. And I will show now, I will show you how we did that. And then we uh, used this configuration to measure the change in the pH um, using this sensor. To prepare the samples, it was very much the same as I showed you when we did the hole, but instead of etching the, the gold, we left it as it is. So this is the uh, graphene only, and this is the nanoparticle, and this is our hybrid. So we can see in the image that the particles are nicely embedded inside. And we confirmed the binding by, uh, or the, uh, the configuration by the Raman uh, spectroscopy. We did a lot of characterization to prove this. And then we started measuring our uh, CV uh, measurement using the circuit that I, I just, uh, I just uh, showed you. So the capacitance as a function of voltage, we can see that with the changing the pH, we see a nice uh, change here. And if we take the flat, flat uh, band for voltage as a function of pH, we see that there is uh, uh, an increase. Uh, this here was the, uh, this is the graphene only, and this is the hybrid. And you see for the hybrid, we have a higher sensitivity. Uh, it was, I think, 20, 20 something, 22, I think, higher sense, uh, increase in, in the signal. And we interpret this here uh, because the, the, the gold particles um, dops the graphene, so it changes the Fermi level up and this uh, enhances the sensitivity. Uh, this is just to show you the flat band voltage at different uh, configuration. And here, this was like a modeling uh, this um, by considering that each interface works as a capacitor, basically. Uh, and this to uh, prove the stability of our sensor. So this is a flat band voltage as a function of time. So up to- Prof. Amel, please yes. consider that the time uh, has been right. completed. All right, I'm almost done. It, I'm yeah, you can done. complete within one to two minutes, please. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, at different pHs, the, uh, we see that the flat band voltage is quite stable. Uh, and it does not change with time. And actually, this was my last slide. I would like to uh, thank my research group. Uh, so Hassan was a postdoc in the group. Now he's an assistant professor here in the center. May did the uh, simulation work. Uh, and here, Ahmad did the pH sensor. Mona is working now in the chemical modification. Everyone else in the group is doing 
work related to biosensing and I would like to thank also all the collaborators and the funding agencies we have fund uh, from the uh, ASRT in Egypt, the SDF pandemic tech and we have all these collaborators uh, that we always work with and thank you very much. I'm happy to receive questions if you have. Thank you so much uh, Prof Amal for your presentation. Uh, we will keep the questions at the end of the session uh, for all the presenter. So now the time is uh, for uh, a presentation uh, also from uh, a presenter from Egypt, Prof. Anas, Prof. Inas, Inas, yes, sorry, Prof. Inas uh, Batisha uh, uh, from National Research Center. The title of her uh, uh, presentation is Phosphate and Phosphosilicate Based uh, Planner, Waveguide and Optical Appli Amplifier Applications. I think uh, Prof. Inas uh, she's, Prof. Ines uh, is not here, uh, yeah, so that, uh, uh, there will be a okay. video on her okay. presentation. Yeah, yes, due, so. due to some uh, technical issues, uh, the Prof. Ines is not here, so I'm going to run her presentation uh, on behalf of her, of course, and uh, unfortunately she's, she will not be here to answer your questions. Okay, please, if yeah. you could uh, share the video. Sure, sure. Could you see the screen? Yes, perfect. Yes. Yeah, perfect. okay, great. How about the sound? The sound is not good, I think. The sound is good? No. Yeah, okay, great. You can increase the, the sound. Please. Increase the level. Yeah, yes. The title of uh, the lecture is Postface and Postface. Now it's better, yes. There is the plumber, waveguide and optical amplifier application. Uh, for that, we prepared for this application, interesting two applications, we prepared the two uh, kinds of materials. The first one is the phosphosilicate, uh, prepared in two forms, monolith and thin thin, and doctor with 20 mole percent of phosphate, and one up to 3.5 mole percent of earth. For the multi-component second form of, uh, kind of material, we prepared uh, the multi component phosphate amorphous prepared by uh, conventional multi quenching technique in the following composition uh, phosphate oxide, aluminium oxide, sodium, barium oxide, potassium oxide, doped with erbium oxide. Uh, first, uh, in the first time, we, uh, instead of potassium, and in second time, instead of barium, for comparison. Uh, the, from the absorption measurements, the absorption cooperation and absorption cross section were calculated in case of melt, uh, melting phosphate. The gain as a function of population inversion was estimated for the prepared sample. The obtained data showed that the amplification would be achieved around 1.5 uh, mi uh, micrometer uh, at low population inversion value uh, 20%. Uh, with the same excitation uh, uh, argon laser, we obtained uh, nearly the same emission at about 1.5 micrometer in the other kind of material of the photosilicate prepared by soldier technique. Uh, uh, characteristic uh, with the intra for a transition of the erbium ion uh, uh, from uh, 4i 13 by 2 up to 4i 15 by 2. Both prepared sample or material form, morphology, and characterized, uh, both characterized by field emission scanning electron microscope and transmission electron uh, mi microscope. Uh, the x ray diffraction and the, the room temperature photoluminescence, luminescence will be evaluated. The aim of the work is to obtain samples with a good condition suitable for. Uh, the, the preparation of the planner with guide uh, by using for the technique and the second by uh, the application of the optical amplifier uh, uh, using the amorphous phosphate prepared by net function technique uh, and many application, many characterization as we informed before should be done to obtain these. 
uh, we I hope to get to give you a simple idea about the soldier methods used for the photosynthesis preparation in our lab. We have four uh, way of uh, our methods for preparation: the spin and the coating for the soldier film film technique and monolith and the power uh, te uh, technique. Uh, a, small, a, a, a very simple idea of the spin coater, as you can see here, um, a motor at, uh, attached to a turntable. This turntable turns from 1,000 rounds per minute up to 7,000. Uh, attached to it is a substrate uh, for the position of the film, and then the solution uh, prepared, uh, 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 deposited on the surface of the substrate uh, droplet uh, by droplet. Uh, to obtain homogeneous and uh, adherent film to the substrate, and the second two photo are for the desktop photo. We will for the spin photo. For monoliths, we have three stages of preparation. We uh, obtain the solution, and uh, after uh, complete reaction of the sample and and the theory and it on uh, on a hot plate. Uh, then uh, we obtain the, the higher volume of pollution. Then uh, we, after two days or 48 uh, hours, we obtain uh, some changes in the solution and beginning of the duration appeared, uh, and the volume was less than the first one. The third one is completed preparation of the monolith glass at 60 degrees centigrade uh, for 20 days in a ground oven where no shrinkage appear after that. The soil gel technique has many advantages, but the most important one for me is to obtain an, an end product in a nano structure or nano scale without any modification. For the X-ray, the fraction and the UV visible near IR absorption spectra of the photosilicate. Uh, in the X-ray, the fraction we obtain on behedral, hexagonal, and monoclinic silica phosphate uh, phases appeared in the sample, and the monoclinic silica phosphate increased in intensity and shifted to lower two theta. For the UV visible near IR absorption, all characteristic band of for the erbium ion uh, was appeared in, in informing that we succeeded in preparing the uh, silica phosphate or phosphosilicate dopies urban without any cluster inside it. Uh, we said that we should have some condition uh, to adjust and to let these sample to be suitable for planar with guide application. First is higher thickness, second is the transparency of the film and the homogeneity of the surface. Third is to have an, a, a Emission at 1.5 uh, micrometer uh, by uh, upon excitation. Now uh, we have here uh, the thickness measured by the uh, cross section of the field emission from the electron microscope, which gave us 1.8 micrometer, which is big enough for confinement of light. And the refractive index has 1.7 uh, for uh, as the value. For the sample uh, uh, heated at uh, 500 degrees centigrade at constant uh, 3.5 uh, mole percent of erbium and increased to 1.8 by increasing the temperature up to 900 or 950 uh, degrees centigrade at constant wavelengths of 1450 nanometers. So, obtain data confirms the possibility of planar waveguides of this material. Uh, to be successfully prepared and allowing the rule of system of guided publication, which is the goal of our work. The transmission electron microscope gave us the amorphous uh, uh, view at lower temperature for the three prepared sample one, two and a half, three and a half mole percent of erbium at AGG. Uh, then, by increasing the temperature uh, to 500, then from 950 uh, for the six other samples, we obtain uh, a well defined spherical uh, particle informing the presence of the nanostructure uh, scale inside our uh, material without any cluster of erbium inside it. 
the room temperature near IR photoluminescence spectra of the erbium ion transition uh, after excitation with argon laser uh, for the sample uh, dropped with 21% of phosphate uh, and the three concentration and up with the three concentration of erbium in one, uh, one and here we adjust to two concentration, one and 3.5. Uh, mole percent of erbium, both centered at 950 degrees centigrade, we obtain the emission uh, near the uh, one uh, uh, near the one point five fifty five. Uh, the first one is for the dot sample is one mole percent of erbium at uh, fifteen forty two and fifty two lower wavelengths uh, by increasing the concentration of erbium up to 3.5 to be at 15, uh, 35 nanometers. Uh, second, for the thin film prepared by four gel technique, we obtain the same, uh, the same uh, emission at nearly at the same, approximately at uh, 1.5 micrometer, uh, but uh, we, we, we quenching at lower temperature due to the presence of the OH group, and then it increased in intensity by increasing the temperature uh, up to 950 degrees centigrade. And here is the, uh, the, the shape of the film when exposed to uh, argon laser excitation. Now we will move to the amorphous phosphate based optical amplifier and laser application. Here, the X-ray diffraction, the absorption, and the photoluminescence. The X-ray diffraction confirms well the presence of amorphous phase. The absorption bands are assigned by comparison with the energy level of previously reported erbium gas system. Uh, uh, the absorption coefficient increased by increasing the erbium ion concentration, as you, as you can see in the middle uh, figure. Uh, it was it is worth it to note that the linear increase of the absorption with the erbium uh, uh, content indicates the absence of the rare earth chemical cluster. And the emission around the 1535 um, nanometer obtained from the photoluminescence attributed to the intrapolar transition of the erbium ion, or the same intrapolar transition uh, obtained in the phosphosilicate of the erbium ion from 4i16 by 2 up to 4i16 by 2. And here is the shape uh, on the left, we have uh, the shape of the uh, of increasing uh, the phosphate. Uh, Doping, doping with erbium, by increasing the erbium concentration, and we can see that the color is uh, being more intense, uh, 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 tan rose, uh, as, we, as we can see here. And the second figure is for the excitation of these samples by uh, argon laser. Now, here we have the gain. This picture uh, or this figure uh, introduced to us the gain spectra as a function of wavelength at different values of population inversion from zero up to one uh, for the two series of amorphous uh, uh, states. Uh, the first uh, is by doping the urgent instead of potassium, and the second is uh, by, doping, by doping the urgent instead of barium. Again, of 0.2 uh, decibel from meter minus one and nearly flat band, which are obtained. You can see well in the figure uh, uh, such uh, uh, flat band. Uh, when increasing the population inversion, the gain value increases and the peak fixes to shorten again for total population inversion at one. The gain peak uh, centered around 15, 22 nanometer for both series. Increasing the urgent content causes an increase in the gain. It can be noticed that the gain is slightly higher for samples stopped with urgent instead of barium than in a set of potassium. Then we advise uh, people to prepare this uh, multi component by using the, uh, the urgent ion dopped in a set of barium. And here we have the table which shows the maximum gain value and peak position versus population inversion uh, for the prepared samples. It can be noticed that the amplification which would be achieved 
around 1594 nanometer for low value of the 8.2. Uh, now this figure illustrates the uh, amplification process around 1.5 micrometer uh, for the two samples or the two form or the two kind of material. The first excited state uh, at four, four I 13 by two level can be populated by first excited the erbium ion to higher one up to uh, two H 11 by two using urban laser at 514.5 nanometer. The higher uh, level then relaxes none Radiatively to the ground state giving rise to the near eye or emission at around 1.5 micrometer. This is the idea of obtaining this emission at this uh, uh, band uh, at 1.5 micrometer. The 4i13 by 2 is a metastable level and a population inversion can be achieved with 4i15 by 2 level. This is the expected uh, diagram of the total internal reflection or confinement of the light inside the film. The light propagation inside the film, the three film of the phosphosilicate uh, from one up to 3.5 moon percent, planar wave guide, and, uh, and down is, this is the up uh, figure, the, uh, or, or picture. The lower one is uh, for the uh, fiber optic, uh, we have a uh, core of the film uh, surrounding by uh, an area uh, uh, with lower reflective index and the idea is to have higher reflective index of the film for confining, confining the light inside it and the lower and upper area, air and uh, the quartz silica substrate for the photosilicate with lower reflective index. Where we, we mentioned that the reflective index of the photosilicate is about 1.8 uh, nanometer. Then the air is 1.45 uh, and the quartz silica substrate is about 1.45. Uh, then we can obtain the total internal reflection and a well confinement light uh, to uh, use it after that in satellite, in cables under seas, and so on, and communication. The same idea, but without shape, is to have this uh, the, the down uh, picture of the up uh, a fiber optic amplifier with four of the film with higher reflective index and trading or surrounding area with lower in, uh, reflective index to have uh, confinement of light and total internal to obtain the total internal reflection process. Then we succeeded in obtaining both uh, kind of application in our both kind of samples. Uh, here we have the recent publication of our team in this film. Have other publication before that, but we were not. Uh, uh, we was we 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 haven't this uh, um, facilities to 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 continue uh, it. Where uh, we traveled many uh, places to measure the photoluminescence and other. Uh, uh, characterization techniques. Uh, the publication is uh, 2019, 2020, and 2021. The final conclusion of uh, is the development of the phosphosilicate erbium nanocomposite uh, and uh, the phosphate amorphous uh, uh, by sequence technique, uh, both dot with erbium toward application of planar waveguide and for the former and optical amplifier for the later. Uh, the the photosilicate film has transparency higher than 92% and also the monolith and exhibit the high uh, the higher uh, high thickness up to 1.8 and reflective index of constant with length uh, equal to 1.7 increased to 1.8 by increasing the temperature and the urbium doped prepared sinking sample emitting light in the region between 1.5 and 1.65 micrometer as a result of excitation by argon laser corresponding to the intraporous transition of the urbium ion as uh, uh, from the first excited to the ground state. The obtained data continues the possibility of to be successfully prepared this sample and allowing the low loss 
system web diet publication which is uh, uh, the goal of our work and the multi for the multi component of these classes uh, the central book is urban instead uh, of variant uh, have a slightly higher gain so it is used to the set of variant may be slightly better for amplification purpose especially when there is no variation in life size between two series the normalized uh, emission spectra of both series shows that the urban eye is homogeneously distributed is, is homogeneously distributed through the graph matrix and there is no big variation in the leading field around the urban eye this result obviously indicates that the uh, that present glasses are promising for laser and optical amplifier around 1.5 micrometers then uh, we can inform that we succeeded in uh, obtaining this two application and we uh, introduced three patents but no answer until now but three patents in this field i would like to thank all our foreign partners from italy france and sweden where this research was performed in frame of significant bilateral project between Italy and Egypt, Sweden, Egypt sharing MENA project, three in hot of Egyptian French projects and Egyptian SDS basic project project in 2014 up to 2018. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Now, uh, thank you everyone uh, for participating in this session uh, now the time is for questions unfortunately we have lost prof marcia due to a problem with her internet also prof inas has not attended to the conference so they will not be able to answer questions however we have still with us prof ramish prof andrea and prof amal kasri to answer the questions first of all we have one question raised by nafisa islam to uh, prof amal the question is uh, any plans to get together with an spr company and manufacture uh, graphene based sensors commercially for instance like biotin based sensors are available from some companies yes prof amal please if you could answer the question uh, sure thank you very much for the question uh, actually we luckily we recently got a capacity building grant here in egypt from the uh, stdf which is a local funding agency and uh, uh, one of the aims of this project actually is to take uh, uh, the sensor the spr sensor and also the new sensors based on uh, graphene uh, for uh, prototyping and then uh, for commercialization for this, we have a collaboration with uh, two companies, two industrial uh, partners. Uh, one will manufacture uh, a chemical-based sensor, and the other one will uh, produce a prototype or will design, actually, or engineer a prototype for the SPR sensor. Uh, I want just to say that there are a lot of companies around the world that have sensors based on SPR. I think there are almost uh, more than 25 or 30 companies doing this so the the challenge is here here is how to make it small enough and sensitive at the same time uh, so this is the yes uh, the answer for this question is yes we are working on that and hopefully uh, soon we can have uh, such a, such a device uh, that can be portable uh, at the same time sensitive enough uh, to detect some diseases at early stage uh, thank you again for the question i hope i answered if you have more questions i'm happy to answer so. Thank you, Prof. Amal. Any other questions from the participants? No more question. So I think uh, we can uh, close the session here. Thank you, everyone, and you are appreciate your participation in the World Forum for Women in Science in, at University of the Hope in Kurdistan region of Iraq. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have thank a you. good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you.